The back people in the front, I hope uh, you all can hear me. Okay, great. Uh, so accessible data visualization, as the name suggests, you all must have figured out. I'll be talking about accessibility and uh, data visualization. In case uh, uh, some are not very familiar with what exactly I mean by data visualization or what exactly is uh, accessibility, I'll be covering them in a couple of slides. So we are all on the same page. So coming to data visualization, <coughs> Uh, data visualization is any instance where uh, data has been represented graphically to derive better insights. So what this means is, if uh, we had a data set like this, which has certain products and uh, certain regions and the sale of the products across those regions, uh, now if I gave you this data set and I asked you questions like uh, which product did best in the northern region, which one did best in the southern region, or uh, in which region did product A do best, or in which region did product C do worst, you would have to go through all these numbers, mentally process them, memorize them, maybe go back and forth among the rows, columns, make comparisons, and then arrive at these answers. Uh, and if I increase the size of this uh, data set vo vertically or horizontally, which means more products, more regions, you would take far longer to come out with answers, and you would also make more mistakes, you're more likely to go wrong. However, if I represented the same data graphically, you would almost instantly have answers to whatever questions we asked, whether it was about uh, a specific product or a specific region or products across the regions, whatever it is. And uh, in fact, uh, one more thing is, uh, with, in the case of the table, you had to memorize or you know, go back to the numbers. But in the case of uh, a data visualization, you don't even have to look at the numbers to come out with answers. You might not even know the exact value, but you know which ones are doing well, which ones are not doing well, and what products they need to focus on. So all of this is possible because of data visualization. And what it does is it allows us to process data not only cognitively, but also visually. So a big chunk of the processing that we would do in our minds using our brain during, using cognitive load would actually be done visually just by seeing and we could see the trends, et cetera. Now data visualization sounds great because it lets us process so much data so easily, but it comes with a problem, which is this. So just as the name suggests, data visualization is a very visual element. It, it, it depends a lot on graphics and visuals to fulfill its basic utility. And because of this nature, it inherently uh, excludes any user who would have trouble with sight. So basically users who are blind. And uh, because of this, uh, any user who is who's blind would not be able to access a data visualization. They would not be able to uh, use a data visualization. And the quick way that uh, a, a normal a sighted user would be able to come out with answers, uh, for a, a user without sight, it would be very difficult to process all of that data. So this is why it's important to design specifically for blindness. Uh, now, before I go into uh, blindness, I'd cover a point about accessibility. Uh, accessibility is actually a broad term. It focuses on multiple kinds of disabilities and also not specifically to digital, but also any kind of product. So I think Andy already covered it. Uh, accessibility is basically designing products in such a way that uh, even users with a uh, disability would not have any issues or you know, discomfort or difficulty in using those applications. But uh, I'll be focusing on blindness because this is the demographic that is uh, most impacted in the case of data visualization, given its visual. So let's see the traditional ways uh, that uh, a blind user would use uh, access content from an application. Uh, the two common approaches are using refreshable Braille keyboards and uh, screen readers. So uh, refreshable Braille keyboards are basically, uh, so Braille is a method of writing uh, content for uh, users who are blind. So it has certain dots that come out from a surface. And the patterns actually allow the user to move their finger through it and read the content. So Braille uh, displays basically uh, convert whatever content is on the screen into uh, uh, Braille. And the user can still access the content which would be on the screen. And the buttons that you see down, those buttons let them move to the next line, the next paragraph, et cetera, so on and so forth. The more common approach is to use screen readers. Uh, screen readers are commonly used because they are very easily accessible. In fact, they are so accessible, you actually already have them in your devices. If you have an Apple device, you have voiceover. If you have an Android device, you have talkback. Uh, someone with a Windows machine would have a narrator. And then there are third party tools like NVDA and JAWS, et cetera. So as the name suggests, these uh, applications, they read out whatever content is on the screen. And uh, users would listen to that content. And they don't only read. They don't only read, they also come with some additional uh, interactions. So for example, if a sighted user were uh, uh, reading an article, they would not read each and every word and comma and full stop, et cetera. They would skim through the article, and wherever they feel this particular area is, seems like something interesting, which I'm not familiar with, they would slow down and pay more attention to it. But in the case of listening to an entire article or a blog post, you cannot really skim through it. So over there, to make it easier, uh, these screen readers come with certain shortcuts, like pressing the H key lets you jump from one header to the other header. 
So at least to some extent, you can decide what areas I would want to focus on, what areas I would not focus on. Uh, there are many more examples. Because of shortage of time, I won't be covering. But you can jump between links and list items, et cetera, and make it more easier. Uh, these features are further enhanced uh, on the web using ARIA attributes and JavaScript. So ARIA attributes are attributes you add to your HTML to make your web page more screen reader friendly. It structurizes the content better. And JavaScript helps you create dynamic content. So going back to our example about the data visualization, uh, a common approach is to provide the data below the chart. And uh, when a screen reader is reading this page, uh, when it comes to the chart, it would not be able to read the chart because it, it is a graphic. But it would offer uh, it, a sentence like, uh, data table where the chart data is available below, and you can access the data. And they can choose to either have that data being read out, or uh, they can proceed with the rest of the content. So in this example, what's really happening uh, is that we are taking the chart, and we're actually taking a step back. So uh, the actual use case of a chart is, uh, is to, to convert data into a chart so it is easy to use. We were actually going one step back, which is we're converting it back into a table. And I'll just play the audio clip of how a table sounds when uh, it is played by a, a, a screen reader. North column to north. East column three east. West column for west. West column for 54. South column 554. Row three product column one B. So as you could see, it was reading each row and each column sequentially. So what's actually happened is we've converted the table into a list. And the screen reader is actually reading the list. And you could imagine if a user was listening to this particular audio clip, you know, like north column 1, north, east column 3, east, etc. And then you ask the user on you know, which product is doing best, which one is doing worst. It would be even more difficult and almost impossible for them to actually arrive at answers rather quickly. So what does this mean? This means that using screen readers and the traditional approach of accessibility, we can make data accessible. The user will know that, OK, product 3 sold 30,000 units in the northern region. But it won't make the insights accessible. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing that you know these many products have been sold? Should I focus on it, not focus on it? What should I pay attention to? Uh, those answers would not come about just because you have this data. And that is uh, the main problem with data visualization. And uh, this is becoming a very more common problem now because uh, we have a lot of data available to us now in all walks of life, not just business, but also in, as, as consumers. Like many of you all would have health apps on your phones, which would have uh, you know, trends of how well you all have been uh, performing, your daily uh, steps that have been walked, calories that are burned, etc. And all of this data is actually shown in the form of a chart. Similarly, if you're uh, investing in a mutual fund or in a stock, if you are uh, trying to compare prices of uh, flights online, we, data visualization is used in almost all of those cases. And it will only become more common. And the more common uh, data visualizations become, the more frequently uh, certain users would be excluded. So this is a problem we discovered here at TCS. And I come from a team named the PXCOE, which is Product Experience uh, Center of Excellence. And it's a hybrid team that focuses on research as well as delivery. Uh, so even I focus on both uh, hands-on design as well as uh, research. But I'm inclined more on research and uh, in the area of data visualization. So one of the areas within data visualization has been accessibility, where we've tried and tested different uh, methods of you know, making not just the data, but the insights accessible as well. Uh, there's still a lot more research to do. There's still a long way to go. But uh, there'll be some certain patterns or guidelines or principles that I could share right now, which would help us at least uh, think in the right direction whenever we try to make a chart or a graph or any data visualization uh, accessible. So the first one is sonification. Uh, sonification is uh, the audio version of visualization. So when we make a data visualization, what we are really doing is we are taking data. There are certain values, like in the case of the product sales, we have 30,000 products, 20,000 products, et cetera. And we represent that using a graphic property. So graphic property is a height, length, breadth, x position, uh, y position, uh, hue, saturation, uh, luminance, et cetera. Similarly, sound also has certain patterns, like uh, pitch, volume, uh, panning, uh, the duration of a beat, et cetera. So using these parameters, sometimes, uh, if the use case is favorable, we can actually uh, help uh, access the data or represent the data using sound. So I'll share a simplified example, which is of a scatter chart. So how many of you all know what a scatter chart is and how, what exactly it is used for? OK, very few, I think just one. Uh, so scatter charts, uh, the most, most primary and common use is to find correlation, which means how does one parameter affect the other parameter? So here we've got certain plants, we've got heat input, and we've got CO2 emissions. 
a scatter charts are seen, uh, I used to see if, if I increase heat input, does it increase the CO2 emissions or does it decrease the CO2 emissions? So if it decreases, if one decreases on the increase of the other, it's called a negative correlation. If both increase and decrease together, it's called a positive correlation. So when you have a chart like this, which goes from the bottom left to the uh, uh, upper right, it's considered a positive correlation because both are increasing uh, simultaneously. And if you have it from the top left to the bottom right, it is considered a negative correlation. If the chart goes haywire, it means there is no correlation and the data points don't really affect each other. The other use case is to find uh, outliers. So as you can see in this trend, the more I increase the heat input, the more I have CO2 emissions. But there is one particular uh, dot at the start where the heat input is low, but the CO2 emissions are still high. So scatter charts help us uh, isolate such cases. Now, for a user, for a, for a user with uh, visual impairment to access this data, they would have to listen to the X and Y values of each and every data point, which would be very, very cumbersome, and they would not even be able to uh, figure out on which point is a uh, an outlier. However, the same data can be represented using sound. So, what we've done is we've played the uh, sound in the sequence of the x-axis. So the lower the heat input, the earlier it is played, the higher the heat input, the later it is played. And the pitch of the sound, whether it's a low note or a high note, it depends on the uh, y-axis. So I'll just play the clip. pitch slowly went higher, like, dun, 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 and it kept going high. So if, if you hear a tone like this going high, it would mean a positive correlation. If you heard a tone going low, it would mean a negative correlation. If it sounded like just noise, the data actually would be just noise. It, there would be no correlation. Another thing I'd like to point out to you is uh, there's a certain point that I want you to pay a little attention to. see it was there are low notes and then it's suddenly a high note and again it goes to low notes so the sudden high note is an outlier so when you give this to a user with blindness and you let them uh, uh, control the playback speed the direction actually move from note to note they would be able to uh, point out such outliers and this will be much more quickly and easily as compared to listening to the entire uh, data set so the other uh, guideline would be leverage technology to do the heavy lifting so in some cases and some use cases, technology can actually do some of the processing for us instead. So this is a Gantt chart. A Gantt chart is basically a method of showing a project plan. Uh, here we have the plan versus actual progress of a plan in the month of uh, January. The green bars represent the start and the end dates that are planned, and the blue ones are the actuals. So wherever the blue one has exceeded the green one, they, there is a de there's, there's been a lapse. It has crossed the actual plan. And the main use case of a, a of a Gantt chart is, as of today, how is my project going? Am I on time as planned? Am I behind time? Am I, am I ahead of time? If I'm behind time, what exact tasks are delayed? And what corrective measures can I take? So again, over here, instead of having to listen from a table, you know, the start, plan, start, end, et cetera, et cetera, we can uh, use code and technology to actually handpick the mo most important uh, aspects. So what we can do is we can take the current date whenever this chart has been opened. And the current date can then take all the planned end dates. And any planned end date that is before today, and the status is not complete, it would directly list just those tasks up front. And this can be placed as a content below the chart. So when a screen reader is reading content from that page, it would say that there is a chart over here which shows the project plan and the data of January. And then it will read out this content. It will say that three tasks are delayed as on 24th of January. And then it'll give you the details of those charts and let you access further details. Apart from that, it then gives you access to the actual entire data as well, in case there was something else. So this is a primary use case. There could be a secondary use case where uh, they would be uh, requiring it. So third one is prioritize common use cases and insights. Uh, so each chart has a certain kind of use case, like bar charts are used for comparison, scatter charts are used for correlation, like I mentioned, pie charts are for composition, etc. So there are some use cases you could always uh, expect given the type of chart that is being used. And you could uh, plan for those use cases by default. So here we have 10 students. And we have uh, certain uh, the marks that they've scored academically. Uh, now, for this chart, the most common use cases would be one for teachers to know which students are doing well, which ones are not doing well, who are the most least, who came first, etc. And for the students themselves, for the parents of the students, they would want to know specifically about their child. 
So before the screen reader can actually read all the content, you can have an option to either listen to it in ascending order or descending order. So you actually will come to know the most and the least up front. And two is instead of reading each and every row and each and every column, you can have the screen reader read just one particular column. And wherever you reach a point that is interesting, you can then further drill down into the other rows and of the, or columns of that particular data point. Uh, the next one is support with descriptive content. So I'm going a little fast because I'm a little low on time. Uh, this is very similar to using alt text for images. So if someone's familiar with accessibility design, uh, normally if you have an image, you're supposed to use an alternate text that screen readers would read describing the image. So the only takeaway here is instead of just using alt text that says that there's a scatter, there's, there's a line chart that shows annual solar module production from 20 to 17, actually describe the insight within the chart as well. So talk about how it's increasing, how much it has decreased, when did it increase, et cetera, points like that. Uh, so this was about uh, complete blindness, where the users would not be able to see anything on the screen. Uh, the other part is about partial blindness, like color blindness. So color blindness is where users can see, but there are certain colors that are not easily visible. And the common ones are red deficiency, green deficiency, blue, yellow deficiency. And this is a simulation of how the uh, a, a, a colored image would appear to different users based on the color blindness. So as you can see, red and green are colors that you should normally try to avoid because they seem very similar, irrespective of uh, how the charts are, whatever the color is used. And uh, any color that is made up of these colors would also appear differently. So try and avoid those kind of colors. Additionally, try to use something else along with colors as well. Like over here, I've used uh, strokes and bars, et cetera, along with the color. And uh, as a for it, it acts as a fallback. So for a sighted user, this might become a little noisy. So in such cases, make it an option. Like you can access an accessible version or no. And this is just a simulation of how it would look for a colorblind person. So as you can see, certain bars, though they are different representations, they appear to be the same. And over here, at least the strokes and columns, et cetera, would make it easy. This is another example where, because of captions, we've made it uh, easy to access because uh, at least the captions represent the data. So these were the guidelines. I'd like to conclude with this slide. These are certain people who've uh, made it big uh, in spite of having blindness. And I'd like to uh, focus a little bit on uh, Helen Keller. So uh, she's someone who went blind at a very young age. She was a few months old. And uh, uh, she didn't only become blind, she also became deaf. So you can imagine data, I mean, she could not access any information because if not sight, then years, but even years would not. And for her, there was another person who helped her uh, named Annie Sullivan. And she herself was also blind. But in spite of being blind, she actually taught her and educated her. And uh, she went on to become an author, a lecturer, a political activist. She actually got a, a master's degree in, uh, a bachelor's degree in arts, etc. And the reason I'm sharing this is because uh, just like Helen Keller had uh, Annie Sullivan, who actually helped her at the initial phase and enabled her to get so much information. Similarly, right now, too, we would have many such people who are with a lot of capability, a lot of potential, who can achieve a lot of things. And uh, these small initiatives, like making data accessible, no, and not just data, but insights accessible as well, could help them to go on and achieve a lot of things. So yeah, that's about it. Thanks.